Thank you very much, Chihep, for the kind introduction. Um, indeed, this is a great pleasure to be back virtually in Aachen, um, or all around the world, I guess, soon. Um, yes, so this is about joint work with uh, uh, my colleagues Denise Belomestny from uh, Duisburg-Essen University and Oleg Budkowski and John Schoenmarkers, who are also at the Wallerstrasse Institute. So, uh, okay. Yeah, now this works. So let me give you an introduction. What is the motivation for this work? Um, you know, uh, option pricing, I'm, I'm mostly working in computational finance and in finance, we start, but this is like the basics of equity model. We start with the model. In our case, this is actually a stochastic process, ST, which is the price process of an underlying of a stock, if you like. And we match this model to a price surface of uh, options. In this case, let's look just at uh, plain vanilla call options and we take uh, a maturity T, a strike price K, and this gives us a number, the expected value of ST minus K positive part. And uh, if we plot this, if we look at this as a function of two variables, T and K, we get the surface. And uh, there are some technical conditions. The first one is, uh, I mean, we are thinking of a situation where uh, we have so, so we're looking at this under risk-neutral pricing measure. Therefore, S is a martingale, and it's a martingale because we assumed interest rates to be zero, but all of this is, uh, is not really that important. The important thing is we match a model to a price surface. The price surface is something that you can also see in the market. And uh, indeed, um, one of the interesting questions that arise is basically the inverse problem, namely, um, how do you find a model? And one very popular way in this community is called calibration. And in this community, calibration really means you take such a surface of option prices. And of course, in real life, this is not a continuous surface, but rather it's a discrete. So there's a discrete number of maturities and discrete number of strikes for which you get the price. And also the price is somewhat noisy because the more precise that there are two prices, a bit and the ask price, and even then it may be kind of noisy in the sense that uh, the prices may be illiquid. But these are uh, details that we are not going to consider today. But the question is simply giving such a price surface, how can I find a good model? And uh, the first thing to keep in mind is that, again, I'm talking about the idealized situation that I really observe all the options so that I have really a surface like this uh, parametrized by time, continuous time and continuous uh, strike prices. In this case, the prices actually determine the marginal distributions. And this is very easy to see. I mean, it's called the braden litzenberger formula. You take the call price, you take second derivative with respect to the strike price, and then you get the density of ST. And this is really, I mean, just write it down, as, uh, write out the integral with respect to a density, and you will immediately see, okay, taking the second derivative will give you the density back. And moreover, I mean, this was the first step. So whatever the model is, the marginal distributions are, are uh, determined by the price surface. But of course, given a set of marginal distributions, um, there may be many, many distributions on path space. So, so to say many, many possible joint distributions which satisfies this. So the first question is of course, among all this joint distribution is there actually a martingale? And indeed there is a famous theorem from the 60s or 70s, Keller's theorem, which says, given the marginal distributions, you can always find a martingale with those marginal distributions. If, and this is really if and only if, the marginal distributions are increasing in convex order, okay? Increasing in convex order, I'm not going to go into details, but 
think of it like this. If you have a martingale and you apply a, 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 a convex function to it, you get a sub-martingale. And that means, uh, sub-martingale means that the expectations are increasing. That's kind of the background here. So it's trivial to see that if you have a, if you have marginals of a martingale, then the distri marginal distributions have to increase in convex order. But in fact, it turns out that this is the only condition that needs to be satisfied. Okay, so this means, given a suitable price surface, there is a model. Okay, good enough. But that doesn't really help us finding a good model or even finding a model. And basically, there are two ways of uh, 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 of, of setting up models that are very popular in the uh, financial industry: local and stochastic volatility. So, what is a local volatility model? A local volatility model uh, looks at the dynamics, uh, like here. So, basically, you have a diffusion process where uh, ds is sigma of t and s uh, times s dw. And the question is, is there such a function sigma such that um, you can reconstruct the uh, price surface as we discussed? And the answer is, and this is also a famous result by Bruno Di Pia from the 90s, indeed it is, there is, and moreover, you can actually write down precisely a formula for sigma. And this is the so-called the Pierce formula. And you see here, I mean, well, there are some conditions, essentially uh, regularity, the, the, the surface has to be regular enough that this all exists. But then uh, if you plug in a sigma of that form here, you will recover all the prices C. Now, this looks very nice, but you realize that the dynamics that this uh, imposes is not realistic. I mean, in, in essence, it doesn't really satisfy some basic time consistency requirements, right? So for instance, um, local volatilities tend to get flatter if T is increasing, but a T which is far away today, will be very uh, uh, very close uh, to the current date sometime in the future. And this formula here basically says, okay, uh, uh, once this, uh, 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 this future day will be close enough, you, you use this kind of vol local volatility. So um, in other words, uh, yeah, there are some problems with time consistency. I mean, not in a strictly mathematical sense, but in a sense of uh, uh, of in the economic sense. I mean, basically, we don't really want the time inhomogeneous model here, like this one. Okay, but uh, the good thing is we can actually get exactly, we can solve the calibration problem, we can get a model, which is a proper model, and which has precisely the prescribed prices. And then the other side of the story, very popular so-called stochastic volatility models. Here, you basically choose a process V, the stochastic variance process, which you parameterize somehow. And then uh, you solve uh, uh, S uh, satisfies the dynamics SV here, okay? And what kind of variance processes are uh, usual? Well, usually the variance process is again a, a uh, a, a diffusion process. So, for instance, here we take a, a, a square root diffusion process, and then the whole model would be known as the famous Heston model. But of course, nowadays we also often like to use uh, non diffusion models for the uh, variance process. Um, well, where the V is just, uh, just a different, for instance, of Volterra uh, type of process. In any case, the bottom line here is, the nice thing about this is that you get realistic dynamics, whatever that means, but you, for instance, you avoid the model, the Heston model, for instance, is time homogeneous. So certainly there, there is no a priori reason to doubt that this gives you good dynamics, but 
exact matching of prices is difficult, as you can imagine. I mean, you have a finite dimensional parametrization here. And on the other hand, you have this infinite dimensional surface of market prices. Okay. Well, is there a way out? And, um, sorry. And one very interesting idea that has uh, popped out long time ago is actually to combine two, the two approaches into one approach, so-called local stochastic volatility model. So basically the idea is to have a baseline stochastic volatility model, square root V S D W, and then which kind of gives you the right dynamics and then you do a kind of small perturbation given by a proper local volatility function so that you match exactly the prices. So basically the stochastic volatility part like gives you a quite good fit already to the prices and it gives you realistic dynamics. And then the local volatility part gives you the exact fit to the prices that you actually need. And when I say exact fit, I mean within the bid ask spread, at least for uh, uh, liquid options. Okay. Now, can we, uh, can we get a similar kind of formula for sigma like the DP formula? And now there is this uh, famous Markovian projection result by Istvan Gyöngyi from uh, 1986, which says that a model like this as the prescribed marginal distributions provided that if I take the condition expectation of the square of the diffusion part here, like this, I recover the sigma to peer, the squared sigma to peer. Okay. And of course, in this conditional expectation, this first part, the sigma of TST squared, I can move it outside of the conditional expectation, and then I arrive at this formula. So the local stochastic volatility model has the correct marginal distribution. So in other words, it, it has the correct prices of uh, uh, call options if this equality holds. And that looks again very, very explicit, a very, very nice formula. And if you plug in this equation into the local stochastic volatility model, you get a model of this type here. So you replace the sigma by the square root of sigma to peer divided by the condition expectation. Okay. And then for the V, for simplicity, I mean, it doesn't really matter at this point what the V is, but for simplicity, let's assume that it's itself a diffusion process. Okay. And this is the setting that uh, uh, Julien and Guyon and Pierre-Henri Labadère in a very famous influential paper from 2012 choose. And um, that looks like a very nice equation, but we realize when you look at this, that uh, the equation for S is actually of mckeen vlasov type because the conditional expectation of V given S is really a, func is a function of the joint distribution. It's not a function of V and S as random variables, but it's a function of the joint distribution. And you know, if you have a SDE where the dynamics really depends on the distribution of the solution, that's a mckeen vlasov equation. And now as a mckeen vlasov system, this is actually highly singular. And the reason why is because the conditional expectation as a function of the joint distribution is uh, not continuous, right? And for instance, with respect to the Wasserstein metric. And if you want to solve mckeen vlasov equations in the standard way, you basically need the same conditions like for STEs, that is 
You want all your uh, 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 coefficients to be Lipschitz continuous, and Lipschitz continuous in, in time, in space, and in the distribution where uh, Lipschitz continuity with respect to the distribution means with respect to the Wasserstadt distance. That's the standard setting for mckean wasserstadt equations. There's a consequence, actually, existence and uniqueness of solutions to this uh, 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 system, which I call GHL for Guillaume Henri Labaudet, is an open problem. So it's not known under which further conditions um, there is actually a solution or there is a unique solution. Okay, so before going further, let's review a little bit uh, about uh, mckean vlasov equations. So what is a pretty standard, pretty general setting for a mckean vlasov equation? I have a kind of STE of this type. We have dxt is some drift or some diffusion part driven by a d-dimensional Brownian motion set. And the drift and the diffusion depend on time, on the solution xt, and on the distribution of the solution x team, which we call mu t here. And as I said, um, Lipschitz existence and uniqueness, the standard class of the existence uniqueness result holds if these functions are Lipschitz continuous with respect to all of the arguments. Okay. And you might think that, uh, well, I'm not sure if you think that, but uh, of course people have also considered, I mean, this is a very uh, well-studied object, this type of mckean wasserstadt equations. So people have also considered singular cases before. For instance, cases in a, in a nice paper by Bossi and Jabir, they consider uh, the following two situations. The first one is we have an equation, dxt is f, of as a function of the density of xt evaluated at xt. Okay, this is of course of the form above because the density is a function of the law, but this is highly singular because it is essentially the integral of a of a, a Dirac function with respect to the law, with respect to mu t. So this is highly singular. Another thing that they consider is, and now we are basically almost back in the situation of the GHL problem from the last page, is a system of this type. So dx is something and dy is given by, so the, 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 the coefficients of dy of y are given as conditional expectation of functions of y given x. Right. And for these situations, they can define, they can get existence and uniqueness of solutions. And especially the second one really looks very similar. In fact, you notice when you go back here, the condition, so we have two uh, dimensions and the conditioning is with respect to the variable in which we are currently looking at the dynamics. So conditioning with respect to S. And the major change here is that here, the conditioning is with respect to the other variable. And it turns out this really makes life much easier. It's a small innocent change, but makes life much easier. And also, I mean, I find also the first one surprising because the conditional expectation is a very singular functional, that's true, but the density you would expect, you would think is an even more singular function. But um, density works fine, conditional expectation is difficult. And in fact, there is up to this date only three partial results to the best of my knowledge for the local stochastic volatility model for, for the Guillaume Arribada Labadea model. And that is uh, 
a PDE based local existence of uh, proof by Abashel and Tashi. Then there's an existence uh, proof when V, the variance process V, is actually a finite state Markov chain, Markov process. And in a very, very good paper by uh, Dan Lecker, Misha Shkolnikov, and Shang, they prove a strong existence and uniqueness of a stationary version of GHL. So basically, they adapt the, the choose coefficient such that you would, such that the stationary resolution should exist. Then you start the process already in the stationary, in the candidate solution for the stationary distribution. And then it turns out you actually get a solution and a unique one, which is the stationary solution, in fact. So, um, yeah, these are the known results. And uh, to be very clear, we are not going to uh, solve this problem either. We are instead going to solve a regularized version. And by solve, I mean uh, numerically. But let's now turn to numerics. What is the actual uh, 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 solution method that Guillaume and Ari Labordier suggest? Because this paper was very, very influential and very important, not really because they set up this problem, but because the uh, device they suggested a very well working algorithm that actually is nowadays a uh, uh, kind of state of the art in the financial industry. So they set up a particle system uh, where uh, the conditional expectation is approximated by some local kernel type regression. Okay. So basically, you, you set up a standard uh, McKean, a standard particle system for a mckean Lazarus equation. And then the conditional expectation is approximated by this quotient of, uh, uh, of uh, pairwise interactions, basically. So, I mean, how you get this is basically you write down the definition of the conditional expectation in terms of densities, and then uh, uh, you replace the densities by regularized version where you uh, integrate over such a kernel k epsilon rather than a delta function. That's the idea. And this works quite well in practice, even though uh, there is not really any theory for this. I mean, there is theory for local regression, of course, but not for uh, solutions to this uh, problem. Okay, so after that introduction, and I see I spent a lot of time on the introduction, but anyway, let's go to, to, to our idea. So basically our idea is very simple. We want to replace this local regression by a global regression. And to set the stage, let's forget about the dynamics first and let's consider a static situation. So we are given a probability measure new and we want to compute conditional expectation of a function of y given x where x comma y, the pair is uh, jointly distributed according to new. Okay, and as I discussed before, what Guillaume and Aurélie Labadea you uh, do is a local regression. And um, we suggest to use global regression. Okay, so you use global basis functions phi, and you set up a mean squared, the mean squared uh, uh, problem for which uh, the conditional expectation is the solution. Okay, which looks like this. Okay, and that, of course, well. Yeah, and sometimes you may not really want to do this. Maybe you want to do some extra penalization, for instance, uh, rich regression to kind of avoid overfitting and to regularize the problem. And we will come to this in a second. Now, the problem of this is um, if you just set it up like this as an abstract uh, problem, you quickly realize that uh, 
Lipschitz, the Lipschitz function, the Lipschitz continuity. So basically, if you if you think back of the of the uh, uh, of the local stochastic volatility uh, mckeen lassoff problem, we need to uh, control the Lipschitz constants for the coefficient functions as a function of the of the uh, state and also of the probability measure nu. And if you do it like this in this abstract setting, then you will find that the Lipschitz constant will explode as lambda goes to zero, the rich uh, penalty term goes to zero, and the number of basis functions j goes to infinity. And that's not good. So we need uniform control of the basis functions in some sense. And the question was then, how can we do this? And what we, what we used in the end and what worked out very nice is to use uh, a Rupertis in kernel Hilbert space as a kind of structured way of identifying basis functions. And let me give you a reminder of what a RKHS a reproducing kernel Hilbert space is. So basically, this is a very, very popular uh, tool in machine learning. And there's really two, I would say, quite different points of view of what the RKHS really is. But let me start from the mathematical point of view. So from a mathematical point of view, a reproducing kernel Hilbert space is a Hilbert space of functions. So we start on a, on a set X. We consider functions from X to R such that the point evaluation functionals, so mapping F, an element of the, of the Hilbert space, to F of X are continuous. That's all. So if you have a Hilbert space of functions such that the point evaluation functionals are continuous, you have a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So why kernel? Where, why reproducing? Well, the thing is, now you have a linear functional which is continuous. Therefore, by this representation, there is actually an element of the Hilbert space such that the, this linear functional is given as an inner product of uh, uh, f with respect to that element kx of the Hilbert space. Okay, so for given x in the space set x we find such a kx. And now, well, we can apply the, we can compute the inner product of kx against ky and define this as kx comma y. So as a function taking two arguments from x. And it turns out that this kernel now, k, is actually a positive semi-definite function. Uh, positive, yeah, positive semi-definite function. Okay. And well, you could turn yourself around. And it, well, it turns out that if I now take the set of all of these uh, functions kx and I take the linear span, this is dense in my Hilbert space H. And OK turning yourself around and going to the more hands-on, more machine learning approach, you could also say, okay, a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, I start with a kernel K, and then I consider all the linear combinations of, uh, 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 of, of these functions, Kx comma dot. And then the closure of those guys define my RKHS. So you can go both ways. And uh, what are examples? Well, again, the idea is often uh, you can get different point of view, whether you start from the kernel or whether you start from a space. And we give you two prominent examples. You can get the Gaussian reproducing kernel Hilbert space by simply compute, I mean, Gaussian, yeah, by simply taking the kernel to be the Gaussian kernel. This is a very popular choice. Other popular choices in the same direction is to use an exponential kernel, okay, other choice. On the other hand, if you start from the mathematical definition, you can, for instance, consider spaces like the Sobolev space, space uh, H10. It is obviously a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. 
And in fact, you can also write down the kernel. But you see that kernel is a lot less regular than the Gaussian kernel. And that is kind of, it seems to be a bit of a, a dichotomy. I mean, sometimes you can very easily write down the kernel, but it's not so clear what the functions look like. And sometimes you can, you, you have a very good idea of what the, what the space looks like, but the kernel may not be so well uh, approachable. I mean, okay, in the Sobolev space, it's not so, it, it's not the case, but anyway. Okay. Now, one very uh, nice observation is that there are very nice formulas for conditional expectations in uh, a reproducing kernel Hilbert space setting and RKHS setting. Um, right. Uh, and to, to go this way, um, the idea is uh, let's first, let's, okay, we consider a, a, a probability measure new, which is in P2, the set of probability measures with finite second moment. And we consider a reproducing kernel Hilbert space H on uh, the same base space X and assume that the kernel is actually square integrable with respect to the probability measure. And then we define an operator on H, C nu, which just uh, uh, which is defined as in this formula. So you take K of X times F of X integrate against nu against the first marginal distribution of nu really. So I didn't really define what this what I mean here, but I think you get it. And this is a Bochner integral because remember the K here is actually a function. So this is an element of a Hilbert space and therefore the whole integral takes values in the Hilbert space. So C nu is really a, an operator which maps elements of a Hilbert space to other elements of the Hilbert space. And now let's assume that the conditional expectation function X maps to the conditional expectation of A of Y given capital X equals to X, where again, the pair X and Y is jointly distributed according to nu. Let's assume that this function for fixed nu is an element of our RKHS. Okay. And uh, let's just compute we will now compute two, we will now compute, we will now set up another Bochner integral and that is we integrate A of Y with respect to the probability measure in a similar way as before. So we multiply with the kernel and integrate out now both uh, variables and we call this C new A, and this actually is an element of the Hilbert space because, well, uh, the, the K is an element of the Hilbert space and we have to assume integrability of A, of course. Okay, and now by basically the tower property of the conditional expectation, we see that this, uh, 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 this integral here on the left-hand side actually equals applying the operator C nu on the conditional expectation function. So in other words, we have an equality, C nu A, a known element of a Hilbert space is equal to C nu applied to M A. And okay, what does this mean? It means formally speaking, the conditional expectation is given as the inverse of the operator C applied to this element uh, lowercase c. I mean, okay, that's what it is. Of course, uh, there are two catches here. The first catch is MA, the condition expectation may not be in our RKHS H. On the other hand, well, the choice of RK, we didn't really choose any RKHS at some point. I mean, this is completely abstract. So basically uh, we probably will be able for a given 
for a given uh, a condition expectation, you will always be able to find a reproducing kernel. Okay. The other problem is that this operator C new is probably not going to be invertible. It's actually a symmetric uh, 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 operator. It is, uh, 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 well, it is self adjoint, in fact. Uh, it is positive semi definite, but it's probably not going to be inverted. But what we can always do is we can basically add lambda times the identity to this operator C. Now it is actually invertible. You can show this. And now use this perturbation to define a regularized version of the condition expectation. And in fact, it turns out that this formula has another very natural representation, namely as a kernel rich regression. So in other words, uh, you, you set up the mean squared, uh, uh, the, the, the sum of squares characterization of the conditional expectation, but instead of taking the inf over all, say, measurable functions f, you take the inf over functions f from our RKHS, and you add a rich penalty term in terms also of the norm of the RKHS. So if you do this, you get the same formula back. And again, it makes a lot of sense to think of this as a regularization of the conditional expectation operator. All right. In fact, you can control you can uh, uh, control the error uh, of this or the difference between this regularized version of the conditional expectation and the true conditional expectation in terms of uh, the eigenvalues of uh, uh, well of the kernel essentially the eigenvalues of this operator C new here's a formula and you see that actually as lambda goes to zero lambda was this regular this penalty term this penalty uh, parameter as lambda goes to zero this difference goes to zero if the conditional expectation is actually in, uh, in the RKHS, right? I mean, if it's outside, if it is, you know, if it's outside of the RKHS, you cannot really hope that. Okay. And in fact, you can go further and you can control, you can get uh, rates of convergence under some additional assumptions. And in particular, what you can get this way is under some additional uh, regularity, but not too uh, strong conditions, you can actually get that this regularized version of the condition expectation uh, uh, function, m lambda a, is Lipschitz continuous with respect to both the measure, the probability measure mu, and uh, uh, the uh, argument x. Okay, and you can. Uh, obtain bounds for the Lipschitz constants, which again clearly depend on the on the uh, uh, on lambda the uh, the penalty coefficient. Okay, so far so good. Does this actually work? So again, we start with a uh, with a more abstract system as as uh, before. The dynamics that depends on conditional expectations and replace the conditional expectations by these regularized versions. So we end up with this type of McKean Lasov dynamics. And in fact, it turns out that this system has a unique strong solution, which is basically a consequence of. Uh, the Lipschitz continuity derived here and standard results for making lots of systems. And moreover, next question is, do you have a uh, uh, propagation of chaos? In other words, do you have convergence of the particle system? So here, this is now the particle system where uh, the law 
the joint distribution is replaced by the empirical distribution? And the answer is yes. This also works and you can get uh, rates of convergence, which are basically number of particles to the uh, power minus one over four. I mean, it's minus one over two, but remember here you still have the square. Okay. So all of this is basically pretty much standard results applied uh, to the system with the regularized uh, version of the condition expectation using the fact that our regularized version of the condition expectation is in fact Lipschitz matrix. And now let's come finally to some numerical examples. Does this actually work? And remember, what we did is, what is this m lambda? The m lambda means you take, uh, you have your particles, you take the arg min over all functions f in your reproducing kernel Hilbert space, and you penalize with respect to the squared norm of f. And there is a very famous theorem in machine learning used all the time, and it's the so-called representer theorem. The center theorem says that in, if you have set up a problem like this, you have n particles, then in fact, the solution is given as a linear combination of these functionals here. So if the kernel evaluated at the particles that you actually used. So what does this mean? It means, I mean, generally speaking, we know that F can be represented as, can be written as a, infinite linear combination of such kernels. This is because of density. But by the representer theorem, you can actually do this as a finite linear combination. And if you plug in this formula, this ansatz in the above uh, 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 problem, you actually have a classical global rich regression problem, a classical mean squared problem with rich uh, penalty. Okay, now that is not sufficient because uh, solving this problem, I mean, you should think that capital N is a very large number. Solving this problem costs order N to the cube uh, 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 computational time, while the error is, at least according to theory, only of order N to the minus one over four. So this is not a good deal, I guess. However, there is a very simple trick that is also very standard in this uh, machine learning community. And that is instead of using all samples here to set up uh, such an ansatz, you, just, you choose a few representative samples. So for instance, uh, in, in our application, we actually, the samples are actually one dimensional. So you can just order them and pick uh, certain percentiles. So say, if you want to use say 20 such representatives, you could choose the uh, uh, N times 5% percentiles of the empirical distribution, something like this. Or if you don't want to go that way, you could simply say, okay, I'm in one dimension, so I just choose a grid of values for X. I just use a grid. And if you do this, you now have capital L samples and the cost is reduced to order N times L squared. And in fact, you will see in the applications, capital L equals 40 is, is certainly enough. Okay, so how can we test this uh, 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 approach? What we chose uh, uh, in this paper is to use actually a Heston model, a stochastic volatility model, to satisfy a synthetic but realistic, somewhat realistic, uh, surface of market prices C. And then we are going uh, to use another Heston model with a very different parameter as our baseline model which we then need to correct by local volatility term such 
that it reproduces the same prices as this other Heston model. And in fact, we use very different parameters. And as I said, um, we add, uh, in fact, capital L that we, we use uh, percentiles uh, and well, basically percentiles, except that it turns out in the tails, you have to add more samples in the tails than this percentile formula, which, but still 40 guys will uh, work out. Yeah, and let's look at some numbers. Um, on the left, you see a smile based on this Heston uh, formula. Uh, you see basically that you reproduce the smile. Uh, well, if you at least if you use 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 5 particles. And I should say here that in fact there are two, there are two ways how the particles are used here. The first one is to solve this actually, actually to solve this mean squared problem. For this problem, in fact, let's say a thousand particles is, is enough. But then after you have fixed uh, your, your coefficients here, you still need to price the options. And uh, in order to have uh, a, a not too high Monte Carlo uh, uh, error here, it is a good idea to use more particles actually for the pricing part, which is cheap. This is much cheaper than, than uh, uh, solving the mean squared problem. So I would say, in fact, uh, uh, you only need 10, you only need a thousand particles or maybe 10,000 particles for the calibration part where you actually solve the mean squared problems and then maybe 10 to the six particles for the uh, uh, pricing part. But of course, there you can do all kinds of variance reduction techniques. You could do quasi Monte Carlo and all kinds of other things. Just if you use plain Monte Carlo as you do here, you need a quite substantial number of particles. And more interesting is the right-hand side. Here you see the error as uh, a function of uh, the number of trajectories. And you see, instead of what the theory predicts, which is n to the minus one over four, I mean, n to the minus one over two in the mean squared error, but n to the minus one over four in the root mean squared error. In fact, you see n to the minus one half in the root mean squared error. And that, yeah, so it works better than expected. Now, one very interesting result is here depicted on the left side, and that is the effect of the regularization parameter. Remember, in our theory, the regularization parameter is absolutely essential because the Lipschitz constant explodes when lambda goes to zero. However, in the numerical examples, the, uh, you can choose any arbitrarily small lambda and the errors will not become larger. Of course, if your lambda is high, then you expect to have a, a, a higher error, but uh, choosing lambda equals to zero actually does not destroy the uh, performance of the scheme. And that is maybe somewhat philosophically in line with the you know, experiences of machine learning that highly overparameterized problems where you would expect horrible overfitting in fact work quite out quite, work out quite well in practice. Um, finally, yeah, we also compared this with the implementation or with the method of, of, of the original paper by Guillaume and Henri Labonier. You can look at the left plot here. And I would say regarding the accuracy, both of them are equally good. Um, but uh, uh, the RKHS problem, I mean, first of all, we have a theory which supports at least partly, I mean, we have a theory which supports convergence to the regularized equation of course, since nobody knows existence and uniqueness of the, of the, I mean, of the true GHL equation, you cannot prove convergence either, or a convergence proof would rather be a existence and uniqueness proof. But uh, we have some theory, and also, um, I think for the implementation, the RKHS method is 
let's say, more well-behaved in some sense. But you can discuss this. Um, and finally, maybe an interesting example is because is the example on the right hand side here. What we do here is we compute a uh, we compute a, an option price on the quadratic variation of the loss price. So what was the idea here? Um, the idea here was we wanted to see that our method produces a distribution on path space which is really different from the from the Dupier model because we actually want to have the situation that we have the same uh, marginal distribution as the Dupier model but we want to have a different dist joint distribution because we want to have this you know stochastic volatility baseline model and this you can see here and you can see it actually for the RKHS as well as for the GHL algorithm that the difference is striking. Here, for simplicity, we actually use a Black-Scholes model as our baseline model. So that means the quadratic variation in the Black-Scholes model is a constant, is a deterministic number. Therefore, the option price is also you know, like this. There is no smoothing out because there's nothing to integrate. And you see, for both RKHS and GHL, you get something very different. And actually, both of them agree very nicely. And this is, yeah, yeah. And this is uh, actually uh, an interesting observation, I believe. But let me thank you for your uh, attention and stop at this point with some references. Thank you very much. <laughs>